Welcome to the Startup Grind. It was, um, it's, it's kind of like, you know, this is Startup Grind and this is kind of like a startup meeting. Yes. And it's uh, actually a lot like a startup because, <laughs> as you all know, it's like six people showing up every day trying to take over the world so, <laughs> and grow it into something bigger. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Where did you, uh, where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, North Dakota, uh, mostly Fargo most of my time. Uh, but my you know, in preschool, um, you know, lived a little bit in Minneapolis, Brainerd, um, born in Bismarck, but spent most of my life in this high school through Fargo, which was 50,000 white people. And I knew that after high school I had to leave <laughs> and see the world. So I went to Michigan State, which was 50,000 people. In a, Arboretum, probably one of the prettiest campuses in the world, 50,000 people from all over the world. And I had, it was like doing the Wizard of Oz from black and white to color. <laughs> so it was a great experience. Fantastic. Yeah. So uh, you chose uh, your early education, you chose a bachelor's in accounting. Yes. What started you off in financials? Uh, well, the way I looked at it is I always had, I, I, I don't know, I felt naturally inclined to that, but the, what um, why I chose accounting was is that you get to see all of the business because you're talking to the cost side of the business, the sales side of the business, the uh, research side of the business. So it was a way to see um, how businesses operate from a central location because you got your book into all of it. Yes. And so that was my interest. Was, yeah. there, a, was there a vision for you to uh, eventually get involved heavily on the, the business side? Or was yeah, eventually, uh, but I wanted to understand that whole flow of yeah. the business from the money side. Yes. Because once you know that, you really have your finger on the pulse of the business. Absolutely. Yeah. So that was the attraction for that. So then you got involved in auditing. Yeah. Exciting, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, the nice thing about auditing is, is uh, I worked with large global uh, public accounting firms, so you got to see uh, all types of businesses from um, large global oil companies to large global manufacturing companies all the way down to funeral homes oh, yeah. and auto dealers, right? So I got to see like the smallest to the largest and and see lots of different businesses. So it was just a, like taking my accounting education and then now looking at it inside of actual running businesses yeah. to get that perspective So and then get it from such a broad scale. So it was, I was almost like a, an extension of it, an education okay. of business. Okay. So focused on you know, that aspect of things and you decided to go back into to college and pursue an MBA? Yeah. What drove that? Well, after you've done your accounting thing and you've been into a lot of businesses and you go, well, I'm, after I want to review what people have decided, I want to start making business decisions, right, and operate your own. So I felt... I needed the MBA. I was also in Chicago at the time, and a few blocks from the University of Chicago's evening program. So <laughs> it was kind of like leave work, walk down the street of Michigan Avenue. I don't know if any of you could live in been to Chicago, but I literally just walked down Michigan Avenue and a few blocks and would just drop into the University of Chicago's MBA program, where you got to see people from all the major corporations inside Chicago come together so you've got a good sense of other businesses working on projects with a lot of people and then learning from you know case studies and other things quite uh, it was great education yeah. so your whole early education early career was almost like a research and in progress yeah a... I would consider it was almost like um, 10 years of learning business from an education standpoint actually being inside businesses and the nice part about getting your MBA in the evening is when you're learning stuff in the classroom that night, it was a remarkable how much you could apply what you were learning to your work, you know, immediately. It was really interesting. Did you go to the, the evening program? No, no you went full time? Full time? No, the XP. The oh, the XP. Yeah. So you probably have the same experience. Yep, yeah, the same building. So, yeah, it's just, it, it's, it's amazing. What? You can get from an evening program as opposed to going full time, where you're just in a full time, so you're kind of removed from the business world. Yes. By going to the evening program, you could learn it and then apply it 
like almost right away. And there was an overlap that your MBA program to the company that you were working for? Um, no, I was working and going to school in the evening. Okay. Yeah. What, what company were you at? At that time I was working for a company called FMC Corporation. They're a large global conglomerate into like chemicals and machinery and, and uh, all kinds of things all over the world. So um, with my MBA program and my previous experience in public accounting, accounting and then learning MBA things and working with a global multinational, you could apply things like you know currency trading and we are doing mergers and acquisitions and stuff like that. So it was um, really a, a fascinating time. The MBA program itself, that's obviously a hefty program, it's an in-depth program. Is there anything that really, really stood out to you as vital from the MBA program? Well, the vital part is, is working with other people from other corporations. I, the way I always look at things is you learn more by seeing as many diverse people and experiences as you can get. Yeah. Um, and so the education is helpful, but where you really learn this from um, talking to as many different people you can, and by being in an MBA program, it's a great way to, of doing that. From one from aspect, what, what are the various, uh, how can I say, it, the various um, you know, points of influence from an MBA program? Um, who's, who's driving that influence that you're learning from? Well, you learn it from the instructors and then certainly from your classmates. Okay. Um, and, um, and then the ability to go back and apply it. And then when you get into a business situation where you have difficulty, you can bring it back into the classroom okay. and talk to the faculty. So you're, you're not only applying what you're learning, but you can take situations that you've got in the work world and bring them back into the classroom. Beautiful. Right? right. So you get a, it, it, it's a pretty remarkable experience doing it that way. I highly recommend if you're doing an MBA to do it as a part time while you're working yes. because you can apply both ways. So you also spend some time as faculty? I, I was a faculty not during that time, but in, in later in my life, I was an MBA faculty at the University of St. Thomas here in town. Okay. Teaching a course I made up and I sold it to the school. Oh, beautiful. And they bought it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like one of the best courses that the school offered because I basically, it was basically a case study course that we would apply real situations of how to increase the value of your company. And then I would bring in like um, executive recruiters, I recruit board members, I brought in NASDAQ people, I bring in uh, well, investment bankers, I bring in legal people that work on stock issuances and stuff like that. Straight so, into the program? Uh -huh, as guest speakers. Fantastic. And uh, the students just ate it up. Beautiful. So it was really fun. It was a, it was a real life lesson that you learned during your MBA program that you just adapted for. Yeah, well, it was basically taking my life experiences yeah. and then a, a, basically I created a class from it and then um, offered it. The school liked it and let me offer it for two semesters. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. So you you mentioned Nasdaq and you know the, the the global multinational organizations that you were involved with. What what drove the decision to get involved with the smaller scale startup environment? Well, um, having having after working with large global multinationals, I, you end up dealing with these large. They're like being on a large ship, and to make decisions, it's really slow moving, and, and there's a lot of politics involved, and there's resource constraints, and where if your budget doesn't get approved, and someone else's budget get approved, you're limited in what you can do yeah. until the next budget, next budget cycle, and those types of things. So having been through that, and I learned a ton from doing that, I'm glad I had those experiences, but um, in every company I work for it happens to get bought out. So after my last buyout, I said, well, now I, I need to go down and work it, apply what I learned and use it now at the small level. Okay. And what's nice about that is that, you know, you're working with a blank sheet of paper, so you get to, you know, take over the world every day <laughs> <laughs> or plan for it. 
So, you know, from the from the startup, the smaller startup scale, you have, you know, there seems to be a lot of focus on lean methodologies mm -hmm. with a you know, strong focus on validated learning. Mm -hmm. uh, you come from an MBA perspective, and we seem to be moving along to this, like I said, validated learning. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing a change in the way we approach starting and, and building companies, running companies? Well, yeah, I, you know, the, the new way it's, it's almost like a scientific method now where you you can do a lot of trial and error and you and that's how you basically develop your business now and you can do it so cheaply right with the internet there's so many things you can do that you couldn't do before yeah but the, the key part I think is that you're gonna have some idea of what you think might be a good idea for a business but you have to get out and start talking to all kinds of people to figure out how they're reacting to it. And not only from who your potential customer would be, but even you need to be out talking to your, you know, who did you, what your cost side of your business is going to be, what other partners you're going to need to get to join your business. Because um, what happens is they're all going to have ideas, and the more people you talk to, the better. Yeah. Uh, because if you just sit in your, your room and you're just you know writing up business plans and writing up computer code or whatever you're going to get delusional you're going to start thinking you've got a really good thing and it's really the wrong way to go because until you get out there people are going to react to you differently they're going to react to what you're offering differently and they're going to give you tons of ideas in my startup experiences we go out and we're just out talking to people constantly and we've gotten a lot of great patent ideas from people that we can implement right away. And I don't know if you know about the change in the patent laws, but it used to be, you know, the first to invent. So you would keep these lab books and what you're doing to prove that you invented this at a certain date. Your Eureka moment came at this time and this date, and whatever. Now it's the first to file. So yeah. the patent laws, if you're, um, you know, if you have a great idea and you're out telling somebody about your idea, um, you got to be really careful that they're not going to take it, file it right away. But you can talk to people in open-ended ways, not really telling them what you've invented, but telling them enough of what you have, and they're going to give you ideas, right, that you can work on and probably patent maybe too, because you're just brainstorming with people. Um, and typically, the more people you talk to, you're going to take a kernel of an idea here, a kernel of an idea there, and make a new combination of something that's pretty cool and then you go out starting to other people and it just builds on one thing and another but we found not only from talking to the customer side but also talking from like um, our cost side we got lots of great ideas too so the ideas don't necessarily just come from the customer they'll come from your whole value chain um, so we basically spread out we form our team and then we just spread out and start talking to people because it's all about your networks and who you can talk to or uh, if people are saying no, then you say, well, if not you, then who? Yeah. And you get great leads off just asking that question. If not you, then who um, should I be talking to? And I've gotten just tremendous leads just doing that off those types of, of that question alone. Um, and you just have to be relentless and talk to as many people as you can to get their reactions on how to, to do it. And you'll find what your original idea was and which could be a, a kernel of a great idea, but what the final form won't be um, will be much different than what you originally thought it was going to be. Uh, that that really ties into you know a work in progress, the, you know the one day or one day way of, of doing things. From an MBA perspective, is that really the business plan sort of methodology? Trying to get you know things really worked out in the beginning before you even get out into the offer. Mm -hmm. You're trying to forecast everything before you even speak to your first customer. Yeah, that, that I wouldn't recommend that because you're going to be wrong. Yeah. It's better to go out and talk to, don't even start doing business plans or yes. anything because you have to go out there and do your trial and errors you know, and just talk to people and say, what about this, what about that? You know, would you do this, would you do that, and see how they react to it and what they would do with it. And once you get closer to where you think it's going to be, um, then you should start planning. But, but and the reason you want to do that is you've kind of talked to all your cost-side people, you've talked to all your customer-side people, 
and you can kind of you can't really build a model until you know your costs, and you can't really know a model until you know your value proposition and how you're going to price for it, right? Yeah. And you can't do that just with an idea alone. So once you talk to these people, the the, sale, the customer side and the cost side or the resource side, then you can start doing you know product costing, financial forecasting, and those types of things because you'll through that discovery method of talking to as many people as you can, that's where you're going to figure out, well, originally I thought I was going to go after this niche of the market, but really they're not as interested, but when I'm over talking to these guys, they get pretty excited because yeah. it's something new that they really need, and it's low, it's more low-hanging fruit than this, what I originally thought. Yes. Right. And then you'll, you'll get a sense of that. And then I would start doing some modeling, and that's where the finance person who's been through a lot of things can really be a bit of value. To you, so you want to kind of get the when you're starting your forming your first team, you want to get um, certainly the person with the idea, but you want to get other people who, you know, the marketing side, how to tell the story, the finance person, how to build the model, um, the engine, if you need engineers, how to to build it, and they'll they'll know the maybe the cost of it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So you want to get, I would say, a minimum you need about. Four people, right? You need a idea, the, the visionary idea person or founder, yeah. an engineering person, uh, a marketing person, and a finance person. At what stage does finance become crucial to start looking into and really focusing on the finance? Well, that's when you when you kind of get pretty close to what you think you got, where you need to start building a financial model. Because until you get, you can't raise money until you get your financial model. But you don't want to start building it too early because it's going to be so wrong because your idea is not going to be right, yes. right? Yes. But within some time, six months to a year, you're going to get that figured out. Once you get that figured out, then you want to start building your model. And then you want to probably start talking to the market because you're not going to go out and raise the money on the idea because they're going to say, you know, if you walk into somebody, an investor, they're going to say, show me your financial plan, right? How much money do you need? How are you going to use it? And those types of things. And then they're going to start asking you questions about your business model and why you think it's right. And so you have to have this model in order to confidently talk about it, right? Because they'll pick it off right away if you're winging it. Yes. If you're winging it, you've kind of made a bad first impression. In this day and age, that first impression is everything. And if within five minutes, if they're not interested in you, you'll know right away and you've lost it. The chance of getting back in the scene again is probably pretty slim. So that whole discussion revolves around the financial analysis of what you bring into market. How do you how do you approach financial analysis of a product? How do you envision? Yeah, how do you go about it? Well, you you need to go about it by talking to people, right? So you know what if people have a pain point, you know how are they going to pay for it? Do they want to buy it? Do they want to lease it? Do they want to license it? You know how what how are they what you're offering, how are they going to compensate you for relieving that pain point, right? And then what do you need to deliver it, right? Yeah. So you need to, um, you know, there's certain costs involved either through labor or pieces that you have to put together to solve this, to deliver something to solve the pain. Yes. And, and then, so that's, the model's kind of based on knowing that process. There's something called, if you're familiar with it, are any of you familiar with Steve Blank? Yeah. Okay, you've been to his website, right? You know, he's a big proponent of the business model canvas. So it's really that business model canvas is where you, the, the nine pieces, there's three pieces on the cost side, there's three pieces on the sales side, the value proposition is in the middle. And so the three pieces on the, on the cost side, there's, you know, cost, and the three pieces on the customer side, there's the revenue side. So you go through and you figure out what all that is by talking to people. And once you have, you know, you're going to make a lot of changes on that, right? There's going to be a lot of cross-outs in each of those nine boxes. Eventually, you'll get, you know, where you're pretty close, right? And at that point, you can start building that up because you talk to your cost side, and they're going to say it costs you X dollars an hour for this type of person. It costs you, you know, if you're doing, you know, whatever. This much for storage, this much for parts, this much for whatever to put it together. And then you have all your overhead, like insurance, you know, rent if you're renting some offices, um, communication costs, um, things like that, right? And then maybe some payroll for general administrative assistance. 
most of you, most of the team is going to be working for equity, right? Because you, you're going to be bootstrapping, and you're going to be actually paying the play, right? You're going to be <laughs> investing in the model to keep it going for the the longer payoff. So at that point, you'll 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 have it. the financial person will be able to sort that all out, right? That's why you want to have them early because you know they're going to tell you. You know, you want to be a, a C corp if you're going to start selling shares because doing it as an LLP is not going to work very well. Because most investors don't want to get a K one, right? They just want to invest in the money and then get a liquidity amount somewhere down the road, right? Regarding C corporations, how and you know the the other alternatives, how does that play into the startup world, especially? Well, uh, you know, I run into it when I when I I you know I get presented with a lot of ideas from a lot of startups and. The, the, you know, they, they talk about how they're fundraising, and, they, and I said, well, what's your legal structure? And they go, they're an LLP, and I said, well, just, I would get that converted as soon as you can, because if you're going to talk to any serious investor, they're going to want you to be a C-Corp, right, and not an LLP. And I guess it's not that much to do it, but some people do the LLP when they think it's, it's better, but it really isn't. Just go try to do a C-Corp as soon as you can, I would I mean, all this, this is from years of knowledge. Uh, you know, this is not something that everyone is going to, you know, pick up off the internet. What, you know, typically you're going to want to get a, a, financial person, a financial person involved on your team. Mm -hmm. What are the key aspects we need to be looking out for in your financial partner? Well, you want to know somebody who, um, you know, is working in a public accounting firm. It's like a CPA. So they'll know, you know, how things should be organized financially, um, accounted for, reported on. Um, but you also want people who are more than just a bean counter, right? You want somebody who's actually been out there and uh, who's structured financial deals to sell a business, to buy a business, to integrate the two pieces together, um, to, um, you know, they don't have to raise money before, right? Because the financial person is very keen and you're raising money. Because they're you're just going to they're going to be looked on as the person the, who knows the numbers the best and the model the best. So uh, you want to get somebody with a lot of broad seasoning in a lot of places who's taken businesses from early stage and, and, and has the capacity to not only help you in the early days but get you through to a bigger size or a liquidity event or maybe even an IPO if that happens to be a liquidity event. In most cases these days. Um, the liquidity event's probably better to be bought out than to do an IPO. I mean, do an IPO, you need, you know, hundreds of million dollars of sales because it's going to cost you about a million dollars a year. Just an overhead to be a public company. Plus, it's going to take your time away from running the business because now you have SEC reports, you have to talk to the lawyers so you don't get sued. You have, you know, you're spending a lot of, probably 25% of your time uh, just managing being a public company, or you could use any other business and get acquired. So. so you need a financial person, but you know, on a more broader scale, bringing on team members, are there any qualities, anything that's specific to the platform for in terms of team members to be mm -hmm. Well, the first is um, they have to be people that are the chemistry right? Um, with Team. Second is you need to have people who are hungry and have the same passion for doing what the startup's mission is. And they can't be, uh, they have to have been in the startup world. You run into a lot of places where uh, people think they want to be in a startup, but then they say, well, you know, what do you mean I'm not getting the cash? I'm not getting paid in cash. <laughs> you know? uh, or they don't understand that, uh, you know, uh, what do you mean? I have, you know, why, why don't I get that done right away, right? You know what? You know, they're, they're, they just don't. They move like a, a big corporation person would move, as opposed to, you know, really fast response rates, right? Um, so sometimes people, you know, say they want to be on a startup, but they don't really want to be. They want to say, say they're affiliated with a startup, but they're kind of doing it as a, as a almost like a fashion choice. But when they're not really um, being an active contributors. So at some point, you can you can pick that out pretty quick because there's 60 in the room, right? 
you know who's delivering and who's not, right? Yeah. And so the ones that aren't delivering you just kind of call out and, and get. Unless there's sometimes you can't do it as fast because you need to find somebody else to replace them before you call them out. But you know you're 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 constantly with sizing people up all the time. How do you handle getting? Letting people go and they it's not working, working out. <laughs> as blunt See, as yeah, possible. It's, yeah, it's best. You know, it's best for everyone to get it out because otherwise, there's all this back talk going on. Like, you know, why is this person still on the team? <laughs> so, so you mentioned that you know, founders may or you know, co-founders, co-founders are, are not really uh, aware of what they're getting into when they when they join a startup. Typically, they need equity sharing, right? At, at what, are, are there common sort of equity schemes that people go for? What are, what are the common things we see well, in sharing? Well, it, it all kind of comes down to, um, you know, first everybody's, what the way we like to do it is everybody um, has to invest in a company, right? Sometimes it's a company or a network, right? How much you can actually do, but at least, so you have skin in the game. Now, um, most cases, what I find is that the founder is the one that had the great idea with the patent. And so when they bring their patent in, they get a large amount of equity because the whole business is based off the patent idea. Um, so they, the founder ends up getting a, a large portion of share of just for contributing their intellectual power for the creation of the business. Um, and generally, that's a, you know very low price like pennies per share. Um, and then as others come into the future, they're, they're investing in whatever the current perceived value is per share. Um, and then there's option grants. So um, the option grants are vested over time, so there's some retention vehicle, right? They're not 100% vested when you get them, but they invest over yes. a period of time. So the longer you shift the company, if there is the liquidity event, Quite what are those typical time frames that this lot of community and that share that you? Um, most of the options that I see, they'll invest over three or five years, uh, depending on, in a typical quarter, okay. right? Depending on uh, the uh, the founders uh, or the founders' lawyers, but the what what's market basically? The lawyers are typically drawing up the option plans, and they they'll tell you. If you have a lawyer that's worth a lot on nerves, I'll tell you what market is. Right? If it's in the free range. Obviously, the grantee wants it to be as short as possible. The founder wants it to be as long as possible, so there's a negotiated price. I'd say, generally, I've seen mostly around three, but I have seen five okay. years. Is there anything in the, in the management team that you generally look for in a startup company? The formation yeah. and of the, the different qualities of it? Well, um, yeah, the qualities are you don't want an egomaniac in yeah. there because yeah. nobody's going to stay. It'll drive out. So you want you want you know mutual respect. Uh, everybody you know gives with their all. Everybody has the same passion for the mission. Um, and uh, you know, and, and the other part is is that. You just roll up your sleeves and get it done. You know, it may not be in your area, but if everybody's tied up on something and you have to do something because nobody else can do it, you jump in and do it. So it's basically whatever you can to make the company successful as fast as it can, you know, certainly ethically yes. as well too. So you're not like lying to investors or whatever but to get the money. You know, to be truthful and honest. And but at the same time you're giving it your all uh, to do whatever it takes to make it happen. Startups that are entering or maybe creating a new market, how does the financials play into that? There's nothing to, there's no history to, to, to base your formation on. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah, that's really hard. Uh, it's a brand new market. Um, but that's where you have to just go out and talk to people and just figure it. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll kind of tell you what you know what it is and then you just refine it over time but you constantly need to be talking to people yeah. because what they will tell you initially and you go talk to them later they, they're they you know they're gathering new information all the time too right and they some people everybody has different risk tolerances of how they want to engage with you some will want to engage with you right away just off the idea alone 
Others will say, well, I don't know, come back. You're way too early. Come back to me in a year, mm -hmm. right? So typically, I'm always keeping a running list of people I'm talking to. Of, you know, who's the, I think, my early person doctor? Who's my more risk-adverse person I'm going to talk to? You know, check in in a year yes. and just say, hey, just want to catch up, just tell you how we're doing. You know, here's our latest executive summary. You know, we'll love to chat with you, write you that we could do better on. You know, always be asking people what you can do better on, what they like or don't like about it, and those types of things. Because you're going to, the people are, are all over the map on risk profile, and whether they like you or not. And then there's the ones that, the ones that are the scariest ones and the biggest time wasters, and you probably run into this, are the ones that are, they're just so excited about your idea, and they just want to suck up all your time, but you can never get them to write a check, right? <laughs> and so, Lately, what we've been doing with my wind company called Sherwin, we're doing a brand new ground, ground world breaking, ground breaking uh, wind company, wind is uh, we tell people it costs you $2,000 to talk to us, <laughs> just to weed it out. Because we've gone viral on the internet, like one day we got 42,000 hits on our website. And uh, we, you know, um, and so we just sent them this form. There's, there's the 10 step process if you want to invest in us. And one through seven is this, and one of the steps is pay us $2,000. We call non-refundable processing fee. And that's how we weed them out. Um, and then when we, the ones that come through, then we know we're not wasting our time with them because they're actually putting money down to, we say it'll be applied in investment. But that way we get the, we get rid of all the time wasters. But we used to chase like a gazillion of these people. And then they would never write the check and go away. And we go, God, you know, you don't have that much time, right? At the start, you're just trying to get to market as fast as you can, and you've got to weed these time wasters out. I don't know what your experience is, but it's probably the similar, right? Where you get? Yeah, cool. yeah. Well, most of the experience with angels investors. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, you're never sure how much they're going to contribute, and you may end up with a lot of investors that contribute a small amount. Um, that's not, as you said, it can be a waste of time. Yeah, yeah. you got to be careful with that. Just angel investors. You know, you get the angels, you get the VCs. At what point in time do you start approaching the age? Is it, is, um, it, is it something that gets progressively, you start there, you go there? Well, there's layers. So when you're first starting out, it's what they call family and friends, right? You're just going to your, your family, your friends, um, your management team. Uh -huh. You're, if you have a board of directors, your board of directors, um, you try to get all your advisors to invest too if you can. Um, so you're going to people that know you well. And the people you're talking to, you can get like some of your suppliers will want to invest too. Because if they believe in you, they'll either invest in equity or they'll invest in deferred payables. Or don't pay me right now, but pay me when you can. Yeah. Kind of thing. Which is like an investment. In fact, it's, it's, it's a nice investment because it's not dilutive. But eventually it builds up to the point where they're going to say, well, when are you going to pay me? And then you go, well, how about we convert it to equity? And so Is we that a convertible note, right? No, it just accounts payable. Okay. You know, they send you an invoice and you don't pay them. You just put a lot of in your balance sheet for the amount of the invoice, right? But at some point they say, well, when am I going to get paid? And we go, well, we convert you to equity, right? So we'll just take this amount, divide it by whatever price per share is, and give them any shares. And we've had some luck doing that doing that as well. Um, so, you know, it depends, right? Again, on, everybody has a different risk tolerance of how they want to play with you. So you mentioned board members, you mentioned mentors. Let's, for, let's focus on mentors for a second. How does the mentor play into the decision making of the, of the company? Well, mentors are, they're kind of like, they'd be like mentors and advisors might be the same. So they're, they're more like, um, I would call mentors more like specialists. They're people that you would go and ask for advice, or they're like coaches in a way, right? They're not actively involved in your business, but they're, they're, they know you well enough to, to you, you can use them as sounding boards. So I want to deal with crap on this problem, what should I do? Because they may be deep in expertise in a certain area that, that you're not. So you want to get as many people from where you're not strong as 
surround yourself if you're a founder with as many people that are strong in areas where you don't have a clue, right? Yeah. Because otherwise you get in trouble. And so that's how you use them, you know. Um, What's the reciprocation for their advice? You know, some will do it for free because they just want they like doing it. Some will ask for um, some options, and then you have to determine if their value is to you is enough to give them some equity in an option. Um, if you find that it is, typically you know, we ask them to invest in the company. If if you find that it is, uh, you know, valuable, what sort of range are we talking equity? Uh, it depends on the value they have, but then they should be an investor in your company too if you're going to invest in them. So there's there's various well, there's three layers, right? There's your management team, your founding team. So your founding team again, you want to wrap yourself with, like I said, at a minimum, the founder, the marketing person, the engineer, and the finance person, and then others around them. Depending on if you're, you know, going global, you might want somebody with some international experience or whatever. Um, and then, um, then you have your advisors, which I really call, um, they're like your specialty uh, experts, right? So they're very deep in uh, maybe a certain point of law, a certain point of a technology, something that you can go deep with them, right? And then you have your board, which is more like your boss, or they're the people that are going to hold you accountable, right? So the advisor may say, well, how did you do this month? And, and on a certain thing, but the board's going to, you're going to meet with them probably uh, once a month, probably in the early days. And they're going to say, well, last month you told me you're going to do this. You didn't do it. Why not, right? So you want your board to hold you accountable and make you stretch and come out of your comfort zone. Right and drive you to success. So you really need all three. Sure, certainly you need the team. Yes, yes. But the team needs to be surrounded by these experts because you're going to run into all kinds of issues where um, you're going to need their advice. And and while you're out talking to people, both on the cost side and the customer side, you're going to identify people, especially if you ask not you then who yes. as well. You're going to find the people that you want to be your advisors. If they don't want to join your team, or maybe board members, um, too, if they want to invest. But typically, we don't let anybody on our boards unless they're investors. Yes. Because um, they they're just too, they're too close to the information. You know, an advisor is not deep into the company. Yes. You're just asking them questions. Where a board is seeing everything, so you want them to be heavily invested. And so we have certain minimum requirements that in order to be a board, you have to invest. A minimum of this amount, um, and then typically, um, as we have, uh, sometimes they'll have a capital call where people have to put more money in, mm -hmm. and then the, that just ratchets up the amount that the board, you know, they may have started at this level, and then after a couple capital calls, they're at this level. So the new board member has to invest equal to what they all invested that, right? So that level keeps rising over time. So, you know, with regards to equity and investors, how does preferred stock work? Well, preferred stock is just gives you a rights above the common stock. That's where the board members sit? No, this is the red art right now, everybody's at common. Common? Yeah, typically a venture capital person will ask for a, a preferred stock. So they sit above everybody else. So it's just a seniority and who gets paid for the company liquidates. Okay. Right? So debt. You would never have debt, but if you did have debt, debt would get paid first, and preferred stock, and then common stock. But in this case, in a startup, you nobody's going to put debt on your company because you don't have enough cash flow to make it possible until you got way up there. By then, you're in the liquidity then territory. Um, so, but typically, a venture capital has for preferred stock, but they're going to want you to be pretty well, you know, revenue generating. Yeah. Past, you know, past your break even point or rapidly approaching your break even point. But generally these days, you're finding most venture capitals are fairly risk averse and want the uh, want you to be pretty well established with a, a, a pipe of sales flow and cash flow. So with regards to the backing you know, that you find with invest investment, uh, public trading, 
moving public, you've raised $7.5 billion in 12 offerings. Take us through that. Well, that's something that you get more involved as you become a more mature company. But let's take it back to the startup world. In the startup world, you're looking for, uh, if you're thinking about an IPO, like I said earlier, you're going to need at least a minimum, a couple hundred million in sales at a minimum, because you have to absorb at least a million dollars a year in overhead charges for SEC lawyers, audits, directors and officers insurance, and, and then all the other stuff you're going to need just to manage being in public. You're going to have to bring in a general counsel. You're going to have to bring in, you know, a CFO that knows how to do public, publicly traded companies. Probably bring in investor relations staff or outsource investor relations staff. So there's a lot of overhead that comes involved with that. But um, what drives but companies it, to go that way? Well, the early stage ones are going to do it because remember, all the employees are going to pay stock options. <laughs> yes. So they need the liquidity event. And by having a publicly traded company, that allows them to exercise their stock options and get paid for all their years of work. Yes, yes. But they weren't getting a cash payment. But they can now take their stock options and trade them in the market. So if you're following the Facebook, when, you know, their run up to becoming public, their stock before they went public was already being traded in the private market in this market called second market. And what happens is they're getting new investors, and if the SEC rules are written, if you're a private company and you have more than 500 investors, then you have to start filing your financial statements with the SEC, even though you're a private company. So the, the joke with, with uh, Facebook was they only wanted 499 friends. <laughs> because once they crossed the 500 period, they would have to file the financial statements with the SEC. But in the meantime, on their run up to crossing 500 friends, they their stock was already trading in the secondary market, in this place called second market, where the private shares were trading because people would 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 you know trade it, pay so much to somebody had the shares of Facebook wanted to pick it out and through the second market could sell it to someone. So there was this pent up demand, you know, certainly they were doing, you know, when they went public I think probably billions of dollars in sales already. So they were of the size that they could easily do it because they already had pent up demand for their shares and they had enough size to absorb the overhead of being a public company. So when you're already generating the, that that revenue, why have more investors? Um, just because investors it's, it's just with? a herd effect, right? It's, you know, if you're the hot thing, people want to be involved with it. So there's never really a point where a company decides that, hey, we, we could, let's, Let's take this on our own. There's, there's always benefit from Well, investors. remember the, the options that the employees were getting paid on. They wanted to get paid, right? So by being public, you can exercise your stock options in the public market and get paid for your work, okay. right? So that's that's really what drives it in the early stage companies, you know, just to get those options exercised. The next reason why you would do it is because you need growth capital. So you would do a public offering because you can raise a large amount of money to invest in the growth of your business, whether investing in expanding it internally or acquiring another company, right, to grow. Yes, I know. So in my cases, when I was doing capital raises, I was working with billion-dollar-sized companies, and we were investing to um, grow the company, okay, or... In one case, we were we were bought out in a leverage buyout through a private equity firm, and then we had to raise the money to pay off the debt from the private equity company. So um, those are reasons why you do it when you're a larger company, either to grow or to acquire um, other companies. So that probably plays into what Facebook's doing now with taking the internet globally. That's a it's obviously a heavy uh, you know, monetization. Backing that needs to to drive that. That's yeah. That's but I think the primary reason was to so their employees could get paid. Okay. Right. Um, but they're, I'm sure they use some of the, they could always use some of the proceeds for for other things. But they're generating so much cash flow now that they're kind of self financing. Same with Google, right? Yeah. I mean, they're generating so much cash flow that they don't really need to do the uh -huh. public offering. So I think the fundamental reason was for their employees to get paid that were holding all these options, so they could get some wealth from their work. 
So backtracking a little you know, more to the smaller size startup companies again, accelerator programs. So tell us about the Clean Tech Open. Well, yeah, there's the Clean Tech Open and other accelerators. I would the the what I really like about them, and there's a number of them now, is that you get uh, they're like deep immersion programs. They're not like a business plan competition where you just write up a business plan and then you send to some judges and they vote on it. Um, the accelerator programs like Clean Tech Open and, and others um, is, you know, you, you take your team and you immerse it in this program and then they surround you with mentors. So they figure out where um, you have a great idea, but you've never run a business, you've never raised capital, you never structured the business, you don't know how to market it, you don't know how to tell the story, you know. Um, and they immerse you with all those people to help you do that, uh, as well as the financial model. Um, so that when you come out of the incubator, you're kind of ready to raise money. So typically it's anywhere from a three to six month immersion program. Someone wants you to move to the city, you know, that the, the accelerator's in. The nice part about Clean Tech Open, it's a national program. So you can uh, be anywhere in the country. Um, and get that type of support wherever you are. It doesn't require you to move to another city, but the only difference is in Clean Tech Open, you have to have a clean tech idea, right? So energy efficiency, better transportation, uh, clean fuels, those types of things. But there are other ones for any type of technology you want to be involved with. You just have to find them out. Um, they're easy to find, too, if you want to, like, Angel List or places like that, they list them. So that's actually culminates at Demo Day? Yeah, that's kind of like graduation day, right, where you are close to graduation day, and the, like uh, Y Combinator, mm -hmm. yeah. where they have the Demo Day thing. And Clean Tech Open, they have a, it's, they have a, a, it's a, it's a national competition where each of the regions uh, has a judging, and they select three or four of their best out of that region and they send them to a national competition. And then you have a national, um, so it's kind of like a, like the football or baseball, you know, in the United States where you have your playoffs regionally yes. Yes. and then you send your regional champs to the national championship and then they, they present in front of judges there. But yeah, I mean, it's kind of like you take all you've learned and then you um, do it at your demo day or your judging day or whatever. They call the event where you get judged of who the best of the best are. For companies applying to the accelerator, is there things that you look for? Warning signs? Um, well, you know, everybody's different, but a lot of people will say they want to be involved, and then they get involved, and then they don't really do the work. But you don't know that until they get into it. It's kind of like when you're calling out team members, you're calling team. Yes. Right? There's somebody that fully enveloped that they can get, that being, being accepted in, because not everyone can get in the accelerator. You have to apply to be accepted in the accelerator. And then once you're accepted in the accelerator, you're given these resources. And so it's a tremendous time. If you throw everything at it, um, you um, can get a lot out of it. But if you just want to say you've been accepted in the accelerator, but you're not going to go through the effort, yeah. like don't even apply, right? Yeah. But sometimes you don't know that until they're already in, and then they, you know, take their foot off the accelerator. Yeah. When they're in the accelerator, and you got to say, well. Well, at Clean Tech Open, they have certain things where you have to show up. They have this um, two-day, um, two- or three-day, uh, it changes every year, but um, let's say three-day um, program where you go out to San Jose, everybody in the country, all the teams select and actually go to San Jose, do a big ballroom and they bring in Steve Blank and Guy Kawasaki and, and all these major uh, heavy duty uh, startup people and all the elements it takes to do your business from financial modeling, cap tables, uh, marketing, uh, business model canvas, uh, you know, lean startup principles and those types of things. And it's like a mini MBA program. Yeah. for the whole weekend, and they do that, right? You get accepted, and then about a, three or four weeks later, you go into this boot camp, and that's the kickoff of the accelerator. And then you go out, and every week you have to prepare certain things. 
over three months, and then you have your judging, and then you, that winner is open to region, gets selected by the national. So it's, I would highly recommend if you have the time uh, and you really want to be successful, it's a great way to kickstart your business. Uh, so the, two, the clean tech open doesn't uh, require you to, to move? Nope, they don't. Yeah. So, like, you were in the, you were in Clean Tech Open. Yeah. My company was in Clean Tech Open. And so, I went now, she went. And it's a three month program? It starts in, let's see, the, the, you apply, the deadline this year is May 1st. They will announce the, who's going to get selected in the regions around the end of May. Uh, so that means around the third week of June, you, I, you go out to San Jose for the training. And then between June and October, mid, mid, mid October, you, uh, is the accelerated program through judging. Okay. So basically four months, four month program. Beautiful. And you can do it right in your city in a lot of the mentoring. If you're not, if you can't, what we do, and I'm the chair of the mentor committee for 13 states in the Midwest, so I have a committee and then we determine who the teams that come into the accelerator. We go out and interview them and determine, you know, where their strengths and weaknesses are and what type of mentors they need. And then we, we, we basically do, it's like internet dating. We find out where their weaknesses are and we have a big pool and we try to find the best mentor wherever they are in the country to, um, talk to the teams and then they kind of have a, a like a date and decide if they want to have a second date and then they get back to us and tell us well we didn't like uh, mentor B but we like mentor A and then we make sure they both agree to work together so we don't have to do divorce court. We <laughs> said <laughs> <laughs> so you both agree to work together. So they self-select basically right? So you have you know you have the right chemistry and then um, and then they just go off and do things and we know it's the way we've been doing it this is we've done it now um, uh, four years, um, is that uh, a lot of the teams, the mentors that have been with the teams end up joining the teams. So we know that it was successful chemistry, right? Because yeah. they agreed to actually continue on as working, joining the teams. Um, and, then, and then a number of our teams have won the national, of the Midwest, we've won the national championship two out of four years. So we know again. Not the teams with good coaching. Fantastic. <laughs> so the clean tech opens obviously revolving around clean tech. Are we seeing a lot of accelerated programs in other verticals? Oh yeah. In Minnesota. In Minnesota, um, well, there's there's the Minnesota Cup. I'm not as close to that. Have you done Minnesota? But they do have some mentoring involved, but it's not over the duration of the time here. Yes. And then there's a, a Project Skyway that used to have an accelerator, but they're no longer doing that. Yes. They're no longer doing the accelerator anymore. They're just doing it as an investment yes. fund. Um, but I'm not familiar with enough of the other ones. But there, I know there's a number in Chicago. Impact Engine is one. It's more of a, it has a sustainability tilt to it. You know, what are you going to do to make the world a better place kind of thing. But there you go and you live in Chicago. It's, the main money of that's coming from the guy that did Open Table, but so they're looking for ways impactful, world-changing things, you know, yeah. clean water, uh, you know, social innovation, those types of things. Fantastic. Um, but there's tons of them that I think uh, if you went to like um, Angel List, I know lists a bunch of them, or even I know if Gus does, but I think Angel List lists a number of the, the incubators around. Um, but they're easy to find because they're always looking for I see for, that, you know, a lot of the companies to join because yeah. they want the, the issue is is that they want a piece of your equity if you're going to go there the nice part of a clean tech open is they don't want a piece of your equity yes right but the others want like six to fifteen percent not only move there but they want some of your equity so if clean tech doesn't want the equity what what's the justification uh the sponsors just want to to make a lot of successful clean tech companies. So you have sponsors like Chevron, yes. Google, um, Wells Fargo, uh, Jones Lang LaSalle was a building company, but they went to screen building. Miller Coors, because water is a major ingredient in beer, and yes, you know, we all know water is the next to oil, right? <laughs> so they want to make sure that there's a lot of clean water so they don't have, so they have a good ingredient in their beverages. Um, and so there, there are people like that are doing it. Dow Chemical 
as a sponsor. So they just wanted to develop, you know, a lot of new innovation and clean tech. And so it's kind of their way of, of being good corporate citizens. Absolutely. Right. And, and, awesome. and, and growing. Fantastic. Yeah. Mark, thank you very much. Oh, thank you.